Okay, um, hello everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Rodos Ali and I'll be your moderator for this session, Imposter Syndrome and Ways to Overcome It. For this session, we have Chris, Chris Marcel James Zubula. joining us as a guest. Zubula. Hello, Chris. Hi. Hi, Fedoros. How are you doing? Fine, Alhamdulillah. So before we start, you please subscribe to our channel and give us a thumbs up. And if you have any question, you can ask at the comment section. Um, so up to you, Chris. Can you tell us a bit about yourself? Okay. Uh, so I don't know if you can see my screen. You could give me a key if you have. You could just, uh... can you see my screen? Yes, you can see your screen. Okay. Okay, so, uh... all right. So I'm um, Christopher James. Uh, Christmas was like a name I coined myself and somehow I've run along with it. And I'm a front-end engineer currently at Turin. And I facilitate and mentor at uh, Andela Learning Community. So. I'm a front-end engineer with about three years of experience, and I have this passion to, you know, build uh, highly optimized applications for the web. Yeah. So uh, today I'll be speaking on, or I'll be talking about imposter syndrome and um, ways to ways to overcome it. So first of all, uh, what's imposter syndrome? So. Imposter syndrome is actually a psychological pattern, you know, where one doubts their competence and accomplishments. I mean, we, some of us, we've experienced this, um, this sort of phenomenon where we sort of like want to attribute everything or accomplishments to just luck. And sometimes we feel like uh, we, we actually, you know, somewhat deceiving the people we are working with because we feel underqualified. And there's this persistent uh internalized fear of you know getting uh external validation like we really really need the external validation and we we try as much as possible to shy away from you know acknowledging our own accomplishments so um some related terms include uh imposter phenomenon uh imposterism fraud syndrome or the imposter imposter experience so uh if you've actually you know felt like this i mean I, I, for one, have actually felt like this, and this is one of the reasons why uh, I found this topic, you know, very, I, like I could relate to it because this was something I used to, you know, I used to experience. I still experience it a bit, but I've been able to, you know, subdue and overcome it to a great extent. Uh, so, so if if you actually feel this way, you know, so we, we could all know that we are not alone. You could you know, leave a comment, probably a thumbs up or something in the in the chat section. So we could all know that this is something we've all experienced or we are experiencing and we don't feel alone. So uh before I jump before I jump into the types of uh imposter syndrome, I would briefly want to talk about uh just a, just give a, a brief history of uh imposter syndrome so uh in, in 1978 um two doctors dr pauline and dr susan wrote an article they published an article targeting uh high highly achieving women uh in in like the workspace so uh in the article they they selected like a sample of 150 women who were you know highly qualified who had this sort of like uh, validation from their co-workers, from their peers, from their fellow employees. And, you know, and they all gave them like credible, uh, you know, they, they could validate their their work uh, outputs and, and they could vouch for their accomplishments. Like these these were women who were highly qualified, who had, uh, who had attained uh, high, high degrees of uh, educational qualifications. But then, when when these women were when uh the they spoke with these respondents they found out that these respondents had uh internalized fear of ac acknowledging their own accomplishments i mean despite you know uh accomplishing a lot at, um, educationally and career wise 
So, um, so years later, uh, after a few, uh, a few surveys here and there, it, it found, the letter found out that it wasn't just related to women alone. Like everyone experienced, um, like anyone actually could experience imposter syndrome. So what are the types of imposter syndrome? We have, we have five types of imposter syndrome. So the first one is the perfectionist. So who exactly is the perfectionist? I'm going to give you an example. So you, I'm a front-end engineer, so it's, it's going to be relatable uh, if you're actually a front-end engineer, but this cuts across you know, various fields and not just um, software engineering. But if you're a fellow, if you're a fellow front-end engineer, you could understand when you probably have, uh, you, they give you a task and instead of having, you know, instead of having, uh, following the minimum requirements, like complete that task, you find yourself, you know, uh, you, you find yourself adding your own features because you want, you want to be a perfectionist. So they tell you, okay, maybe we click this button, this should happen. But because of what, you, because of what you want, it, 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 it's no longer, uh, it's no longer a, a, it's no longer an issue with the product, but with yourself, because you feel like the product itself is not perfect. So you find yourself introducing new features that are unwarranted. So that's an example of a perfectionist. And you find it very, very difficult delegating. Yeah. And like, you know, trying to, let's say you're, you're in a team, for instance, of, with other front end engineers, mm -hmm. you find it difficult, you know, trying to like delegate task, tasks and you accuse yourself if you miss a high target. And most times these high targets are actually set by yourself because you were the one that, you were the one that actually introduced that feature. Uh, I, I, I know a couple of us might actually have or have met people or know people who are actually like this. And another trait is you feel like your work must always be 100%, 100% of the time. Like, so for every task you do, you, in fact, I think it's a mistake. You don't want to take it like a top notch, 110, 150%, like all of the time. So one of the ways to actually overcome this sort of imposter syndrome is starting with the minimum requirements. Nobody is saying don't add functionality, don't try to improve you know, the features of the existing product but, or, or like um, uh, improve that task you are given. But normally when tasks are delegated or assigned, there's always a minimum requirement for that task to be complete, right? So one way to like uh, do that is, first of all, focus on the minimum task, the base task, and you try to complete that first of all before you could now start integrating uh, your own features. And before you do that, you try to also reach, reach uh, across maybe your team lead to know, okay, if uh, what you're actually doing is going to be uh, to the advantage of you know, the products, like those functionalities you, you think about, you're being creative and you're adding them uh, would actually yield to you know, something positive on the product. So that's it about the perfectionists. Uh, Nobody's saying don't be creative, but at least focus on the task before you know doing additional stuff. So the second one is the super person. Uh, most of the time, most most often, uh, these people are characterized by uh, believing that whatever accomplishments they do is targeted is targeted uh, or is or what what accomplishments they achieve is based on how much work they do and not really how important the work is. So you see people who sort of like, uh, they feel they need to put in long hours to work. Not really that, their focus isn't on, on the importance of that particular task that they are doing. Or that, or that, uh, they, they, feel, they rather feel that they need to uh, put in more work. They feel like if they've not done much work, then, uh, they've not done anything. So some of the traits include um, showing workaholic traits. So we probably could would know a lot of people who put in long hours to work that it affects both their, uh, their lifestyle choices, it affects their passion, their hobbies. And another particular trait is they get extremely stressed if things aren't working out. So instead of coming down, let's say while, while working on a task, they figure out that, or they hit, they hit a, a bug sort of. Instead of them trying to, you know, take time, maybe take a break and um, look for an alternative way to fix that. 
they get extremely stressed because their all their thoughts is hinged on the fact that they need to put as much time into you know working working uh into working on that particular task so most of the times they see themselves as superhumans so one way to actually overcome this is knowing that there's always time for everything i, I normally tell people that irrespective of how much we cherish our workplaces some like it's it's a, it's a harsh truth but we're highly expendable like if for instance you fall ill or you become incapacitated to do that particular job you'll be replaced so being uh, having this type of imposter syndrome what i would, what i would normally advise is you take out time for yourself you know take out time and try to like do other stuff they, they, we've, we've, we've probably heard of cases where someone is having a bug and they left their computers for for some time and they came back and they figured out ways to like do that take a break it's it's always advisable so the third type of imposter syndrome is the natural genius so back then in secondary school we would probably be a lot of people that have straight A's and uh, they're always known to achieve stuff in like uh, flying colors. Uh, they're the ones we always know as being smart. And so one thing peculiar about these type, the, the, um, people with this type of imposter syndrome is the fact that um, they rely on the fact that things are easy for them or the, the, the ease and ability at which they grasp things. So sometimes they try to underwhelm how uh how complex it is, a situation or a task could be because they feel like okay since they are naturally good at something like this you know they should you know excel at some some um, some other thing but the thing what 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 what, pro, what problem this sort of like creates for them is when they don't um see themselves achieving you know uh such expectations uh, they they have they are, they are sort of like withdrawn and you know they sort of like feel sad that they can accomplish this despite being you know natural genesis and like uh like the perfectionists they sort of like have this tendency to set uh, exceptionally high standards because of you know how other people perceive them so some of some other traits include uh you dis they they dislike the idea of having a mentor so when they they're like what's what's the importance of having a mentor i mean like i know i sort of like know everything i should be able to like know everything and you know uh solve any task uh and that thing is like they love their comfort zones a lot so they avoid challenges especially if it's outside their domain of expertise yeah so you you find people shying away from tasks because they they that that's not a domain they, they have control of you know probably when they're delegating new tasks they'll shy away instead of them trying to like you know uh try out new new things uh they decide to like you know just be withdrawn uh and avoid avoid those challenges so one way to actually uh work on this particular type of imposter syndrome is getting out of your comfort zone a lot and not uh not taking anything for granted so yes you you might be naturally smart but then there's a reason why documentations exist and there's a reason why certain guidelines exist. So don't, don't just take everything that, okay, okay, since, oh, I know, I know JavaScript, I should be very, very good at PHP. I mean, it's not just the same uh, dynamically typed language, the clever variables and all that. No, don't do that. You, you could leverage on the fact that you, you could easily grasp things and still, you know, go through, go through the required guidelines, you know, so you don't, you don't experience this sort of like imposter syndrome. So the next one is the soloists. Uh, we probably could have, we probably would have met people like this on teams. So basically the soloists are uh, those individuals who uh, feel like they don't need anybody's help. And it's not out of them being uh, probably say rude, but it's because they feel like when they reach out for help that people look down on them. So that sort of like makes them a bit withdrawn and they want to you know, accomplish everything alone. They, they feel like they don't need anyone's help. So these are some of like the common traits for, for like the soloists. I mean, we could have made a couple of people like that. Uh, so one way to work on this is just like uh, the, the, uh, the natural genius, you try as much as possible to, you know, 
reach out to people when you're stuck. You know, just because you uh, you you just because you you're stuck on something doesn't mean that if you reach out, people wouldn't you know people wouldn't be willing to help you. I mean, if someone is not willing to help you or someone sort of like um, ridicules you for asking a question, then it's not on you. So if someone makes you feel bad for like reaching out uh, on a particular topic or problem you're having, then I mean it's it's not it's not your fault. It's the person's fault because uh, the person isn't really being a team player. So one of the ways to actually overcome this sort of like imposter syndrome is you know trying to reach out when you're stuck. In fact, even when you're not stuck, when you're probably trying to like uh, share ideas or you know just reach out. If and even if times when you you know you feel you could be in the shoes to in the shoes to help someone else please feel free to reach out that's actually one of the ways to overcome this type of uh imposter syndrome so the next one is uh the experts so uh this sort of uh people uh, or people who have tendencies of having this sort of imposter syndrome are people who you know they've been in a particular role for like a very long time and they feel that no matter how much they do, you know, they still don't, they still don't know enough. Yes, uh, the field is, the, the, the software engineering field is very, very vast, definitely. But then it doesn't mean we should, uh, we should undervalue our efforts. So I know most of the times you do it for bands, right? You see someone probably calling you, ah, chief, ah, software, this one, ah, this one, this one. I'd be like, no, it's not me. I'm not that kind of person. I know some people do it for the bands, but some people also do it because they feel, uh, they have not merited what uh, the the credits that the credits that uh, people are actually you know uh, the credits they've actually accrued. So they deny they deny when someone calls them calls them an expert. So I've actually mentioned that, and they shy away from roles if they don't meet qualifications. I've actually uh, heard people tell me this a couple of times. They'd be like, okay, uh, this job requires this and this and this and this. And I tell them, but you have built something like something like this, you've done something like this. But next thing they tell me is that no, but they still don't feel like they have what it takes to like do the job. And I tell them that what's the worst that could happen if you apply for the job? It's a no, right? Like what that's that's the worst that could have happen. But so why don't you why don't you take a stab at, at it and just try to apply? I've seen people who have qualifications for like better roles and they shy away from it because they feel uh, they've still not met, you know, the criteria for that particular role. Okay. So one of the ways to overcome this sort of imposter syndrome is uh, always, always try to make that move. Try as much as possible to make that move. If you see a qualification, if you see a, a role on opening, and you've you've looked at you, you've you, you've known yourself, and you feel like okay, you have. Um, even if you've not, even if you've not really met the qualifications, let's say you at least you meet a certain aspect. For instance, let's say they're looking for a full stack. Uh, let's say they're looking for a full stack JavaScript engineer, right? And let you've you've worked majorly with, on front end, and you have some experience with like Node.js because you've worked on some Node related projects. I mean, so why don't why don't you apply apply for it? You know, just try apply. I've seen people who have. You know they are stuck in. You ask someone and they say, "Oh, I'm still a beginner developer. I'm still a beginner developer." Meanwhile, they've actually built tangible products, but they just they don't just want to put themselves on the spot. They feel that once they put themselves on the spot, you know, uh, people could people would think people would assume that they are frauds or something, and which is which is actually the basis of uh, imposter syndrome. You know, so uh, these are actually the uh, the types of imposter syndromes and how to overcome them. Thank you. So I'll be taking questions. Okay, thank you very much, Chris. I yeah. admit also I've been a, I've been guilty of this expert. <laughs> okay, okay. So, so thank you so much for that. Um, so my first question will be. Yeah. Um, how was it to you starting out in your career? How was it? Okay, so starting in my career, I'd have to tell you that I had a lot of imposter syndrome. Uh, so something I forgot to mention was you can you probably might not have one form of imposter syndrome. Like you could have like maybe three traits uh, or three different types, embody like two different types or three different types. 
So uh, I started programming early, uh, but I always felt like I was never good enough. And it made me jump across many languages. Uh, I had to like try this language and try this language and try this language. And before I decided to like, you know, say, okay, you know what, it's, it's enough. I have to, I just have to like do this. And that was how I started building myself professionally. It wasn't, it wasn't really easy at first. Um, but another thing that helps, uh, you know, with imposter syndrome is actually, you know, building stuff. I feel very, I feel very accomplished when I build stuff. So when I take out like uh, side projects, I build, I build up myself or, you know, when I build a certain functionality, like in a team, it gives me this sort of sense of accomplishment and, uh, and sort of like reduces the, the level of imposter syndrome that I have. Yeah, so. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much, Chris. Yeah. Um. So, so um, during interviews. Or tests, okay. Yeah. Have you ever gotten overwhelmed by imposter syndrome? And if yes, how did you overcome it? Oh yeah, I I I I I, I think I'll still say I get overwhelmed, like during interviews and and call like interviews and tests. Uh, but for interviews, I think I've probably had that on check because uh, la sometime last year, I I was just applying for, I was, I was just applying to companies for the sake of interviews, right? Because I, I was just basically putting myself out there, you know, trying to overcome this fear of like, you know, uh, fidgeting or shivering like during interviews. Uh, so that was actually one way I, I, I sort of like accomplished the interviews part. For the test parts, one thing I would say about the test parts is uh, preparations always help. So if if you always, you know, if you feel like you always uh, fidget during tests, uh, one one thing I'll, I'll tell you is prepare beforehand if you can. That's if you know the type of test you're going to be getting. Because most times um, the companies or the interviewers will tell you that these are kind of... Uh, test you should be expecting. Maybe sometimes they tell you it's a take, take home tests, you know, uh, where they, they tell you, okay, go take a few days off and work on this stuff and, you know, bring it back. Some people it's on the site tests. When I mean on the site, like uh, live coding interview or live coding challenge, and you're doing it right there. So if it's for the live coding, uh, live coding challenge, I would advise you, uh, in fact, let me give you this trick. One, one way to is your live coding challenge is to carry your interviewer along actually um you might not you might not get implementation 100 percent correctly but share your share your thought process that's what most of the interviewers look out for when doing live coding uh, challenge and even if it's take home you when, you when when you're done always try to share your thought process because share your thought process of conversing with your interviewer there's this um you become there's this level of familiarity that gives you that makes you comfortable during that period you understand because now you get to like uh, know this kind of person. You're sharing your brain, your 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 thought process. You know, uh, hinting at why you should you're, you're choosing a particular implementation over that. And with that, uh, using that sort of approach, your interviewer um, would respect you a lot because even if your implementation is not hundred percent correct, hundred percent right, your interviewer knows exactly what you're doing. Sometime sometime early this year, I took I was. Uh, I took a test, and during the test, I was actually told to implement a certain functionality, right? And I, I, as I was implementing the functionality, I kept telling the interviewer, okay, this is what I was going to do, and this is why I shouldn't do this. And, okay, I know I could do this this way, but I don't really know how to do it, but I could just Google, Google it. And somehow, I, I still landed the job. So always be, uh, if, if you're having tests or interviews, just try as much as possible to, you know, converse and have this sort of like communication with your interviewer. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much, Chris. Yeah. Um, so three years, three years plus is a long time for someone who has worked in a, like a lot of places, right? <laughs> yeah, so, I could say that. <laughs> <laughs> so do you still feel that imposter syndrome? Yes, I actually do. Uh, I do. Uh, so one one thing I noticed I'm um, actually trying to overcome is the fact that uh, 
I so, sometimes I get a task and I need this sort of like external validation from my team lead, you know, to take a look at my implementation. Not necessarily because uh, I'm trying to get his opinion, but I just want him to confirm that what I'm doing is actually correct. And in the in the long run, I find out that what exactly I was trying to do was exactly what he had in mind. So I, I, I noticed that um, recently and it's something I've been trying to overcome as well. You know, I want, I want to be able to, you know, be quite confident in my implementation. And if if we probably, uh, I, could, I could reach out to you, but now me reaching out to you, probably maybe if I'm stuck or I'm trying to just get your, your opinion about a particular issue and not just because of the fear of me mess like me coming up with the wrong implementation for that functionality. Okay, okay, that's really great. Um, yeah. so is there like any opportunity it has hindered you from taking? Oh yes, there there has been a couple of opportunities that's hindered me from. Uh, yeah, a couple. Uh, I remember when someone someone gave me uh. Actually, two different people gave me two opportunities. One was with a remote company abroad, and the second one was a relocation opportunity. And the the funny thing, the funniest thing about this whole stuff was I, I sort of completed the challenges, but deep down I just felt like they weren't still good enough for me to like submit. I mean, come on, what was the worst thing that could happen if you submitted? It was a no, right? But I felt I felt like it's I shouldn't have. You know, make that submission. So you could say two, two very good opportunities lost, but I don't think there's something I would, that's a kind of mistake I would ever make again. Yes, that's true. That's very true. And the next question is <laughs> kind of a tricky one, but as as Africans, sometimes we we don't really feel comfortable sharing our accomplishments, right? Because yeah. we think it's bragging. Oh, we might believe in our village people too much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I get that. Yeah. So how do you deal with that? Okay, so personally, I'm one for putting your work out there, right? If you can brag, brag. It's something that you did or it's something that you worked on. I mean, um, it's one thing to brag about your accomplishments and it's another thing to, you know, downplay your achievements. Now, you could, you know, brag, bragging about your accomplishments, I don't mean, you know, going about, talking about everything, like what you did, or this one, this one, or okay, I built this stuff yesterday, I built this stuff today, I'm building this stuff tomorrow. But you need, you need to put yourself out there if you actually want to be relevant, especially in this, in this field. Yeah, I know there are a couple of people who aren't, um, how would I put it, who aren't, you know, putting, some of their work out there. But then you, you find out to an extent that these people are probably established in some ways. Sorry. So they're probably established in some ways. Uh, for the village people, we both know, I don't know. I don't really care about village people, and I'll still tell you not to. <laughs> Please, don't say this in front of your village people, though. But, like, um, you, sh you should always try to... If you, if you do something right, if you do something and... You feel it's something that's going to be helpful please feel free to like share your work because it's not going it's not only going to help you it's also going to help other people right there are a lot of people who what you've actually done would help right so you just yeah simply put put yourself out there share your share your work share your details i know it's an african thing most people tell you to be humble and all of that but there's a difference between being humble and you know, uh, talking about your accomplishments or putting yourself, or being relevant, you know. So I don't know if that answers your question. Yes, yes, actually it does. Uh, thank you very okay. much. Uh, right. So as a facilitator and mentor in ALC, okay. that's a lot of responsibility, right? And you get to teach lots of people. Do you yeah. feel poster syndrome when teaching them? Okay, so I don't when I when I teach or when I mentor or facilitate uh, events, it's yes. actually it's actually one of my it's actually one of my 
safest places. So I rarely feel uh, imposter syndrome uh, because I if if your if probably my mentees uh, uh, throw a question that I'm not capable of you know answering or I don't have an answer to, I either refer them to someone else that could or I I just you know send them uh, send them probably links that could help you know that could help them out. So I don't feel imposter syndrome while uh, while you know coordinating any of the uh, ALC sessions or whatever sessions. Okay, that's that's nice. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, sure. So looking back at uh, something you read. Okay, yeah, go on. I'm here with you. Looking back, what is the one thing you regret that you feel imposter syndrome is the cause of it? Sorry, I didn't get that. Okay, I said looking back, what is one thing you regret? That you feel imposter syndrome is the cause. Okay, you mean something I feel that? Yes, oh, yes. Okay, something I feel that. Okay, uh, like I mentioned, like I mentioned earlier, um, I I feel I feel that living I feel that leaving the country for one. <laughs> so thanks to the imposter syndrome, and uh. I, I have, uh, I sort of like have projects that I felt were going to be very, very beneficial, probably open source projects that I felt were going to be beneficial, but somewhere along the line, I just sort of like grew cold feet. I don't know if it was necessarily due to imposter syndrome or due to the fact that uh, I got tired of the projects. So, but there are some of the, some of the opportunities I've actually lost, uh, like I mentioned earlier, uh, Relocating or leaving the country, then getting some you know, nice, uh, getting to join some like amazing companies uh, remotely, just because I I was scared I probably wouldn't you know contribute or perform as expected when I joined the team. Okay, okay, that's really nice. Thank you very much. And that's all the question from my side. And now we'll start answering from the audience. Okay. How do you okay. differentiate? Okay, okay, so go on, go on. I can hear. How do you differentiate between a perfectionist and being obsessive? Uh, being 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 obsessive. I don't think I don't think there's any difference. If you're if you if you're perfectionist, then somewhat somehow you're doing you're you you have you have like a you have this high tendency of being obsessive. Because you're obsessive towards uh, how you're, you're, you're obsessive towards how uh, towards how you feel about the product, or not, necess not necessarily the uh, the requirements in that particular product or that uh, that particular task or product um, specifies. So yes, I, was, I I don't I don't think there's a difference, and I wouldn't. Uh, I, I don't. I don't think there. I don't think there, there's any difference between being a perfectionist and being obsessive. I mean, this this is actually in terms of like you know, um, this is actually work related because I know some people could be obsessive about something else, you know. But like giving a job and you're a perfectionist on the job, I would say yeah, you're preferably obsessed. Yes, that's that's really nice. Thank you very much. I hope your answer has been. Your question has been answered, uh, Um. Then yeah. next question. Okay, sorry. Um, before I answer this, can I say go if you probably have uh say it like you have a follow up for that question and maybe why you think so? I'll be I'll be, I'll, uh, I'll be glad to like uh, have the conversation. So can we assume fear to be an imposter syndrome? Uh. Okay. Yeah. I. Yeah, to an extent, to an extent, I would assume fear to be an imposter syndrome because what imposter syndrome does is it's it puts this uh it fills your mind, it fills your mind with doubts about your accomplishments and your achievement, first of all. And when that happens, you find out that the next thing that comes with it is you know the fear to assume certain responsibilities. And there's this particular fear 
uh, internalized fear of being uh, being caught as a fraud because you feel like, oh, um, you know, I'm sort of like a fraud. I'm not really good at this stuff. What if, what if these people find out I'm not really good at this stuff? So yeah, that's the fear. So yeah, we can assume fear to be, I don't, I wouldn't say fear to be an imposter syndrome, but I would say imposter syndrome sort of like leads to, you know, having, having that fear. So Chris Marcel, what about the case where you aren't qualified and you overestimate your skills? Hmm. What about the case where you aren't qualified and you, you overestimate your skill? So uh, every every job role has has a set a set uh, a set number of requirements for you to like meet or minimum requirements for you to like meet that role. So if you aren't qualified for a role, right? If you, if you aren't qualified for, for a role, then if you overestimate your skills, I don't think that's an imposter syndrome because you're 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 just you're just taking on responsibilities that you can't cater for. You understand? So like the, the instances I gave where when you're actually qualified, but you sort of try to downplay your accomplishments, it's not the other way around. You're actually qualified for the role, but you look at the you look at the requirements and you're like Ah, I can't really do this. I'll, I'll give you an instance. So let's say, um, let's say you're a React developer, uh, for instance, and you have like maybe you have like you're just starting out, and you have like maybe you have less than a year, a year of experience working with React. And in the in the job requirements, you're told that you need. Uh, to know probably some advanced techniques, or at least you need like years of experience, and they need some advanced React React techniques. And you go ahead and over you know over qualify yourself or overestimate your skills. Yeah, you might land you might land the job, but it's it's not necessarily imposter syndrome because you, you definitely went and took on a challenge that you couldn't you know you couldn't uh, you couldn't work on. So that's not. That's not an internalized fear of being a fraud. I would, I would actually say you're, you're being fraudulent to an extent. So, yeah. What would you say is the best way to start learning to code? Learn by building or learn the basics first. Okay. Um, okay, learn by building or learn the basics first. Uh, I've always been uh, a fan of learning the basics first. I know there are different school of thoughts to approach to learning code. Um, some, some people believe that by le learning by building, you, you, could, you could learn a particular tool, a particular framework. There, there was this argument once, whether, what should you learn first? Some people were like, I mean, between React and, and JavaScript, some people were like, they learned React first before they learned JavaScript. And, and um, some, some were like, uh, they learned JavaScript before learning React. So for me, I would like, always learn the basics first. Because there's a time, there's, there's definitely going to come. Uh, there's going to be, there's always going to be a time when the basics would some somehow come and haunt you. Yes, after learning the basics, one of the ways to solidify your skill will be by building. I always tell people that you learn the basics first, then for you to like grow, you learn by building, um, building or working on projects. So I I don't think that both of them are sort of like independent when learning how to code. Uh, but I'd always say learn the basics first before learning uh, or trying to like build stuff. Because if, if we're being sincere, if you're building stuff without learning the basics, how do you get or how do you understand what you're working with? So let's say, for instance, you're learning how to build an e-commerce site and you find a tutorial online that says, okay, do this, do this, do this, do this, do this, do this. Yes, you might actually accomplish uh, that particular task and build that e-commerce, uh, build out the e-commerce platform or e-commerce app or whatever it is you're building. But then again, what if, what if you know that situation, you know, you're presented to like do that stuff or certain functionality about, about that task changes. You'll find out that you're not knowing the basics, just sort of like haunts you. Wondering, is it imposter syndrome if I resist the temptation of applying for a CTO role that requires four years experience in my start, but starts when I have just two years experience in only one stack? 
and get let me just go through it again is it imposter syndrome if i resist the temptation of applying for a cto role that requires four years experience in many stacks when i have just two years experience in only one stack uh i wouldn't i wouldn't really i wouldn't really call it uh, imposter syndrome because from from the question uh i would, I would it's safe to it's safe to say that uh the, you didn't necessarily meet the requirement right because i mean from the requirements you need at least four years experience in a diverse array uh in a diverse array of stacks and you just have two years so yes i mean there, there are instances where people learn on the job to be sincere and probably you could you know get the two years like your two years experience you could actually get the job but these are these are these 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 um these sort of experiences are sort of form like appliers um they aren't really much because somehow the you don't you don't really meet uh the qualification i would say i would say it's i would say it's imposter syndrome when you actually have that four years experience in like many tasks and like this this is the expert syndrome so you actually have the four years experience but then you have this cold feet you, just, you get this cold feet when you want to apply for that particular role which you qualified for so you have the you have the, you have the qualifications but you just don't want to apply because uh because you feel you don't necessarily meet uh meet that criteria can you please tell us how to build self confidence and avoid low self esteem okay um so talking about self confidence one one way to build self confidence like I sometimes tell people is conf confidence comes from uh, confidence. So, so it's somewhat related to how competent you are in a particular field, right? I mean, if you want, if you want to command, if you want to be commanding, or if you want to command a particular field, I think you really need to be competent in that field. There's a reason why people like um, people like um, Christian Wamba uh, and Unicode, Unicode developer that is prosper. There's a reason why, you know, they are actually somewhat respected in the community, and it's because of how much they command the particular space they find themselves in. So, if you want to build self confidence, if you want to build self confidence, try to be competent enough in in your field. So, let's say you're building, let's say you're a front end developer or a back end developer, put in much work to understand the craft, because you understanding the craft means you could you know you could make key you could you, you could contribute to major uh uh decision making uh decision making roles so that way you could actually know that you know your onions in that particular field and i think by doing that you could avoid low self esteem because self confidence i think is uh is sort of like the negative of you know having low self esteem i don't think i've seen someone who has low self self esteem as still is quite self confident Okay, uh, are there any other questions? Uh, Fedos, are you there? Yes, I'm there, there's a question. Okay. What advanced things should a React developer know to stand out and be highly valued? Okay, well, uh yeah, this question is being thrown at me maybe because uh i don't consider myself an advanced react developer uh so uh but i could i could list out a couple of things that i feel you should know uh, as as someone who is quite competent in the field uh so for instance you you have an in-depth knowledge of um, the react life cycles i mean everybody is using hooks right now but before hooks, there was always the React life cycles, and you have any knowledge of how that works. Uh, you also you could also explain how the virtual DOM works. You know, you could uh, you could explain that. Uh, you could you know how to perform unit tests with Jest and Enzyme and some other uh, related tools. Like you could comfortably write unit tests and test your components. 
and you care about accessibility a lot. Uh, your components are highly accessible. And, um, another thing I probably missed uh, is, uh, uh, let me see. Okay, so always uh, knowing, always sort of like being attuned with the constant changes because I, React, React is, React is, um, React evolves, and if you could also, if you could also somewhat evolve with it, you know, using new concepts such so as, um, say, portals, for instance, uh, you know, understanding how rendering in React work works, uh, um, right? Like, um, you know, understanding why why React is actually being used in the first place. I mean, most people can't explain why React is being, why React is actually being used in the first place. So some of these things, you know, when you you have knowledge of some of these things, I don't know if I, if that could if that could be considered as being advanced. Uh, but I mean, knowing some of these things would actually show that you know what you're doing. Okay, okay, thank you very much, Chris. And now that you have identified me as an expert. <laughs> 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 you identified me as expert in imposter syndrome. Okay, okay, anyways, thank you very much for the session. And we we'll like, uh, what do you want to say now? Okay, so uh, my final words would be imposter syndrome can be very, very, I don't know, it's, it's, it could be very, very difficult to overcome because, because of that internalized fear of acknowledging our accomplishments. But I believe that it's something worth working on if you actually want to advance in your career, because you need to take a comp you need to, you know, acknowledge your accomplishments. You need to take credit for something like what you've actually put in efforts in. Sorry. Uh, always try to put yourself out there, you know, um, when you when you build something, be proud of it. I mean you worked on it, so be proud of it. Carry it on your head if you want to. Uh, also, share uh, share your thoughts, share your opinions. If you feel like you're having imposter syndrome, try as much as possible to like you know reach out. Or if you find out someone is having imposter syndrome, uh, try as much as possible also to you know always you know validate that person somehow because some because to an extent that's what keeps them going. But then if you're having an imposter syndrome, try as much as possible to, you know, like if you fall within the five categories of, you know, imposter syndrome, uh, try as much as possible to just work on it. And yeah, those are my final words. Okay, okay. Thank you very much, Chris. Thank you very much for the wonderful session. And okay. I think for now, but before we go, please, do subscribe to this channel and also okay. like and also everyone like the like the channel and subscribe and don't forget to share your takeaways um on twitter you can tweet your lesson whatever you learned in this session tag efx unilag using hashtag b next conference hashtag ecx unilag and tag at Chris Marcel. Thank you very much, Chris. And Hi, also, thanks very much. don't forget to join our live phone quiz. We have the code shown on the banner, so you all can join the quiz. Thank you very much. All right. It's actually amazing being here and sharing my thoughts and opinions. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.